morning, Frank, or perhaps I should say good morning, Mr. Frank A. DeWitt, former faculty member in the School of Printing at RIT. Uh, well, Frank, as I mentioned to you several days ago, I have started what I have dignified by calling an oral history of the Institute. Very good. And in this, I'm interviewing some of the deans and the department heads and other old timers who I have asked to reminisce about things that they remember about RIT, and therefore I was particularly happy to meet you uh, once again at the dinner the other night, and we had a chance to come over here and chat with you. Uh, I've forgotten just when you came to the Institute, but when did you come and how did you happen to come? <coughs> Leo, I think I came in 37. Uh, uh, 38 rather. There's a letter from Mark uh, mentioning this and uh, these I have several letters. They're all dated 1938. Uh, <coughs> the arrangement was that uh, I should spend the summer before the uh, school year began. Uh, partly in Chicago, partly in Philadelphia, uh, going to uh, a printing school in Chicago to learn press work because they didn't for sure have a press work instructor. And I had never, uh, I had very little background in press work. Um, so I came in 37 and 38. 38. In the 38, which was the second year of the printing department. The printing department at that time was in the basement, directly under the library of the Eastman building. Well, now uh, Dr. Ellingson and Mr. Frank Gannett had uh, brought the Department of Printing up from Ithaca, as I remember, yes. in the fall of 37. Was it? Yes, uh, fall of 37. And I think the printing department at that time consisted mostly of some linotype machines because that was the thing that, uh, that was the kind of instruction that was needed most. It was, uh, it was a trade school approach. It had been the old Empire State School. Of yes, printing down old, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I guess they had some few small presses and uh, monotype machine, quite a few old linotypes. And those were placed in the basement of Eastman, yeah. right under the library. Uh, now, who else was on the faculty in the fall of 38? Well, it was Joe Serace who taught linotype, and Joe Serace was a real character. Uh, had been with the school for a long while and, and uh, stayed, uh, stayed uh, in Rochester, I think, for Ten years or more. Joseph Race, uh, Richie came the next year, I believe. Uh, when did A. Randolph Karch? Oh, yes, our <laughs> Randolph Karch was there. He came the the, the first year in '37, uh, and uh, he was he was sort of my immediate boss and. We enjoyed each other pretty much because uh, we talked the same language and, uh, and were irritated about the same things. <laughs> uh, Cox was a little bit more out, more outspoken than I was. But, uh, he was called technical supervisor. Yes, was he not? yes. He he always felt uh, a little bit grieved that he wasn't wasn't counselor, mm -hmm. which I think was the term for head of the department. Yeah, and Byron Cole. Yes. Uh, as it turned out, I think I think it, it was good that, that Byron had that title right from the start. Of course, he didn't have much background in printing. No. But he he got along very well, and he he built up this art approach, this art, uh, the the teaching of art of courses in in uh, design and so forth, mm -hmm. which. Uh, very vital to printing. Well, then the year that you came was uh, Mr. Culver, Carch, Joseph Reyes, 
himself. Yeah. And Don Ritchie then came the following year. Yes. Uh, I think there was a man that finally came to teach press work, so I didn't have to do it that first year. But I'm not sure whether he came that year or not. He came from Mealy, and uh, his name isn't in this 47 list, so uh, at least I don't think it is. Uh, I forgot. I've forgotten his name for a moment, and he may have come in the middle of that year. I'm, I'm not quite yes. sure. Uh, now there were, I don't know whether, the, I guess the English and uh, uh, mathematics and anything like that was probably taught as a service course. By, by the liberal department. Yeah. Those days. yeah. Well now, uh, how many students did you accept, say the fall of 38, the fall of 39, approximately? We must have had... Uh, Ten or a dozen, I think. maybe more. I think I think what happened was that the work, the uh, enrollment built up to about 41, and then fell off very fast as the boys had to go to war, yes. and then built up again very fast when they started coming back in 45. But there was a period there during the war when uh, I guess they were more faculty than there were students. And uh, several of us, I guess I was the only one from the printing department, but several of, of us from the Institute were alone to our, alone to uh, U of R to teach uh, physics. I remember that. John Elbert was there. John and uh, Colton and, uh, and possibly one or two others. Mm -hmm. And I, I enjoyed that very much. Now, uh, the program when you first came, it was two years in length full time, was it not? Yes. The students spent two years in yes. school. There's no cooperative. Uh, no, I think there never program. has been, has there? Not really. They have a very, very modified yeah. program. They call it co op at the moment, but that's uh, not really comparable to the co op in the engineering department. Well, now, how did you happen? To, what was your background? Well, uh, this is uh, what happened. I. Before I went to college, I worked in a printing plant in Brattleboro, E.L. Hilders and Company. I learned to set type by hand and, and learned to operate a line of type. Then, this was during two years right after high school, then I decided to go to college. I went to Middlebury College. And when I came back, I went back to work with Hildreth. Then there was a uh, depression and uh, didn't work in printing for a year or so. Then I went to New York for about a year then to Brandon, Vermont, where uh, I was uh, sort of in charge of this country newspaper working for the, the editor. And, uh, uh, so I, I thought, well, I, I better go to summer school. So I went down to, uh, to Pittsburgh to uh, the school down there. Carnegie Tech? Carnegie Tech for summer course. And apparently, Karch had written them asking them for suggestions as to who might be good uh, for him to hire. Mm -hmm. And uh, apparently, they gave my name, although uh, I don't have any, any record of that. But mm -hmm. Karch, I think, told me that. Mm -hmm. And so he wrote me, and it was it was, uh, uh, it was it was quite odd because uh, because when I gone to Carnegie Tech, I had considered writing RIT. I had seen publicity about RIT, so I think I did actually write RIT and asked them if they had any course that I could go to, but I, I don't know what happened to that. But in any event, Karch wrote me soon after I got back from uh, Pittsburgh, and I, they wanted someone for press work and I think hand composition they mentioned, but I'm not sure. And I wrote and told them that I didn't have any background in press work, but I'd be very interested in hand composition or machine composition. So they invited me out and talked with Caldwell, Ellingson, Karch, 
and they finally gave me this. They, they quite soon agreed to, mm -hmm. to uh, hire me, offered me a job. And, uh, so I came out and took it. But the, the, uh, I think that there's this, there was a sort of a trend, not a trend then, but a practice then to put people, faculty, where they were needed rather than where their Make background. Was, yes. So I got a chance to teach uh, press work and I had a very good course in Chicago, in the Chicago School of Printing. Very good instructor there and I made it. I've got a notebook that full of stuff that I did. And uh, <clears throat> I wrote some instruction manuals for some of the presses, which I did by, by re rephrasing the, the company's manuals. And I wrote an instruction manual for uh, hand composition, mm -hmm. which is this one here, which uh, they still use. For heaven's sake. At least they use mm -hmm. some of the lesson some sheets. Right. It's a sort of a, almost yeah. a self-learning yeah. operation because mm -hmm. Uh, the student uh, can almost start with no knowledge at all and by just answering yes or no questions he can gradually work out uh, huh? arrive at uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. <coughs> I think uh, Lawson told me they still use that or use some of the sheets well, now your uh, major middle grade been English it, right? no math oh math I yeah. didn't realize that yeah um, Math or physics, I think it was math, mm -hmm. uh, technically. Yeah. And I, I did very well in math. I always liked math. And, and so uh, <clears throat> it worked out very well. I, I majored in math because I was interested in math. One thing also I, I did at Middlebury was to avoid psychology courses in education courses because I decided that I didn't want to teach mm -hmm. and I didn't want to say if I I figured that if I wasn't prepared for it no one would offer me a job but uh, that didn't work out uh, the way I had planned it well now who were some of the other key figures around the Institute when you came you mentioned Byron Culver and uh, Karch uh, well Marion Steinman the librarian I I think she came after I did. I'm not sure when she came, but she's in this 47 list. And uh, I, there was another librarian before that. Mary uh, Havens. Mary Havens, yeah. yes. And I guess maybe Marion Steinman. But Marion Steinman was very sympathetic with, with the things that we needed in the mm -hmm. printing department. And, uh, helped out a lot. Right? Yeah, she yeah. helped out a lot in ordering books uh, and helping the students. She, yeah. she helped students a lot. Uh, there was a man by the name of Province. I asked you about him the other day. Uh, Leroy Province, who worked for the library, had a radio program on Sunday, which was a book review. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was hired to teach, just to teach history of printing. I don't think he taught anything else, but he came down once you know, several times a week to teach history of printing. I had taught it the first year. Uh, he was very good because he would he would uh, bring things from the library, uh, documents and books and things like that, Went way back. And, and work them into the, to the uh, textbook, which was uh, a very authoritative book, but a little bit stuffy. I don't remember him. I don't know whether I ever met him or not. Well, uh, he went to New York and the uh, city, and I don't know, I don't know where he is now. Mm -hmm. uh, who else was there? Well, the, the people I remember are generally people I met in the lunchroom, Moorcock, Donaldson. And incidentally, have you talked to Donaldson? Not yet, no. Okay, he's. Uh, yes. I used to meet him uh, up at South Southtown Plaza mm -hmm. several times. Once on the uh, uh, well, I don't. Uh, 
recall any others. I don't recall any others, but I'm sure there were there were a lot of them. Well, I can look those up. Oh, uh, Frank Clement was was one of the faculty that I knew quite well. Yes, he, I, he was in general. I took an effective speaking course. Mm -hmm. from well, now you taught what hand composition then primarily? Yes, I, I taught hand composition, but if you look on that uh, that list there, you'll see that there's quite a few quite a few things. I was a little bit surprised when I looked at it. Yes, this is hand composition one and two, estimating, yeah. makeup, technical literature and reports, and production. Yeah. Well, uh, principally yeah. estimating and. Uh, Hand composition. Mm -hmm. Now, later, uh, later on, uh, quite a, quite a number of years later, I taught a course called Science and Printing, in which I tried to to bring in things that were just beginning to be talked about then, you know, electronics yes. and printing. And I, I I don't think I ever fully convinced most of the students that that this was going to come because it had been 500 years in coming and they didn't see why it should now. But some of those students I've seen since then and they commented on how, how the course really, uh, really did it help. Bring, bring things out. Well, now at the, uh, the time you were there in those years, as I remember, uh, Carnegie Tech was the outstanding school of printing yeah. in the country. Yes, it was. Everybody tended to look towards Carnegie Tech. Yes. Uh, what do you think led to the demise, let's say, of Carnegie Tech and the rapid increase in the reputation of RIT? Well, probably it was, it was probably people at the top, like Mark Ellingson at RIT, who uh, was going to have a printing school, whether or no, and did have one, yes. and he his his encouragement, personal and and, uh, and official to the printing department, I'm sure had a lot to do. And then of course his his uh, meeting with with people in the industry, mm -hmm. which uh, he did uh, quite actively at that time. Yes, he was very much interested. In uh, this this was this made it it made it almost certain that RIT would would have a printing department. Now, I think the opposite happened at Carnegie Tech. I think I think the president of, of Carnegie and uh, probably the dean of, uh, of, of the schools, which included the printing school, they, they uh, didn't, they didn't, uh, what, what they did offer wasn't really what students wanted. Sometimes uh, the students went there. It concentrated, I think, more on the business aspect of yeah. learning. As I remembered it at one time, they also put it in the school of in the College of Engineering. Yes. And this, you know, would have been all right if, if they'd have if they had faculty members and full support and everything. It doesn't make a difference what you call it. If if uh, the subject matter is there, and if they had really related engineering to printing, that would have been something new at that time, yes. and it could have done, it could have been very successful. But if they didn't. I don't think they had the morals. The school had the moral no. support of the college. And, by, and as I remember it, uh, I visited Carnegie Tech once. So they required the freshman printers to take the same courses as freshman engineers. Yes. And the math was way above what yeah. the printing freshmen were capable of yeah. understanding. Well, then later, at Carnegie Tech, I believe they moved it over into the School of Management. It was called a major in printing management at one time. And now I believe it's in the School of Art and Design. Is there anything? Well, I guess they're taking 15, 20 students maybe yeah. still. I'm not positive as of this fall it's still in operation, but it was several years ago. You could teach some aspect of printing in almost any uh, curriculum that, uh, that you could think of. Yep. Art, design, engineering. But the, uh, certainly, as you mentioned a little earlier, the enrollment was very low, although it built up to 
40 odd students before the war and then paid off the practice. Yeah, out. zero. But then when the GIs came back. Yeah, they were a joy to teach. Uh, they, they were, uh, uh, they had a lot of uh, energy and a lot of enthusiasm, uh, sometimes a little bit too much, but they were, they were easy to, to work with because they'd been sitting around not doing too much in some cases, thinking about uh, what, what they needed. And one of the things they needed was education, I guess they realized. They were well, anxious to get it. That's right, but we haven't mentioned the fact that in 1946, wasn't it, the Clark Building was finished? And yeah, uh, actually, I think it was, I think we moved in in 47, 47. I, that may well have been. I guess the cornerstone of that building was laid in 46. And probably was at least a year later before you moved in. Yeah, it, we might have moved in in 46. Maybe we did move in in 46. Uh, I'm, see, I left RIT in 47, I think, because this is 40, 40, the list is 47. I think I left in the fall of 47 mm -hmm. to go with commercial controls mm -hmm. to uh, help in the development of the Just the Right Act. Yeah. <clears throat> and then I eventually came back in, in 55. Uh, it stayed until 60, two or three, and I went with three. Mm -hmm. So, uh, well, there's been quite a change from 47 from the standpoint of the, the physical location and the number of students enrolled and the faculty just between 47 and 55. Isn't it? Yes, yes, uh, quite, quite a quite a change, except they were still using the same physical location. And I remember we had printing classes, that is classes in salesmanship and, and uh, uh, the science and printing. They were scattered all over. You, ne you never knew where you were gonna have to go yep. to meet your class. But your laboratory but the, facilities took up the whole second floor of the class. Yes, yeah. And they had had uh, advanced some, but uh, I guess really not too much mm -hmm. until they, they moved out and went to the other campus. Mm -hmm. Now, who were some of the students, Frank, that you remember the best? Or those that well, they named for themselves. I you? remember a student by the name of Tori. Uh, Got his first name for a moment, and he was a friend of this uh, Leroy Province. Uh, Tori was older than uh, than some of the others, and uh, so we used to <coughs> we used to associate quite a bit. Uh, actually, Tori went with me to Vermont in '41, uh, '40 or '41. Uh, one summer, where I set up a little printing shop for the Red Love School of Printing. And Tori went up and helped me for a week or two to start. Uh, there was, uh, I think, Briggs, who now works for one of the local printers. I guess he's vice president, I'm not sure. Well, there was a tent rate that was the chairman of the board of lawyers co-op at one time. Yeah, I did not, I don't think he was, I don't think so, no. Maybe, maybe the, uh, he made it all on his own, I'm not sure. He was, he was one of the early students. Um, there were a couple of girls in those very early classes. I don't know whatever happened to them. I remember they can't remember the name. No, I can't either. Carolyn, wasn't there a Carolyn Eisling or something like that? That sounds quite familiar. I think she went with Case Hoyt. Oh, oh, I know what you mean. Uh, 
That's not quite the right name, I don't think. Oh, it doesn't sound right. But uh, she's still there, I think, or she's still in Rochester, and I, mm -hmm. I, I have seen her from time to time. Uh, yeah, she was. Uh, she was one of the one of the early students. Uh, well, of course, Alec Lawson, who's uh, on the faculty, yes, since graduation, was uh, one of your early students. Yes, and Ralph Tufts. Now Ralph was uh, oh, yeah. a graduate and is listed in here as uh, as also teaching hand composition uh, that year and, and some other courses. And then he went with one of the Buffalo newspapers. I think he's still there. Mm -hmm. Who was the chap that uh, had such a problem with his face? Oh, there was a, a war. He was a war or a, a GI, I think, that's the one you're talking about, and he'd been quite badly wounded. He was in really bad shape, and he really, sh he really wasn't wasn't able to keep up with all the work. But but he came there on the GI Bill, and I think he was getting 100% disability. Probably something else. I think that's the one you mentioned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I remember a name Russell Hopcraft. Yes. For some I... And I don't know where he is, but uh, I think I've run across him once or twice. And, uh, was Ed Balcom there? When you were... Name is familiar. He was, was a his... basketball player, but he also was a very fine student with Prince. He was uh, captain of the basketball team. I think the year, the, the only year that Institute went through an undefeated season. <laughs> and he's done very well. He's with a printing firm, I believe it's in St. Louis. Well, now, you mentioned this Breadloaf School a little while ago. You you went back there several uh, summers in a row, did you not? Yeah, know? two or three. And we, we got out several uh, little booklets up there, little booklets of poems and uh, things of that sort that were written by people at Breadloaf in the, in the uh, either the writer Breadloaf Writers Conference or the Breadloaf School of English and the uh, students there actually set the type mm -hmm. and then we printed it on a, on a hand session proof press. Is that, Is that no, no that, that uh, the war we, we kept it up I think one year I think in 42 started in 41, I think, 40 or 41, and I think the last year was in 42. Mm -hmm. right in the middle of the mm -hmm. Well, what were some of the greatest satisfactions you had while you were there? Well, I don't know. Uh, of course, at that time, uh, <laughs> uh, I didn't realize I was going to have to look back. And, uh, of course, I enjoyed the, I enjoyed the, the chance to, to, uh, to do things pretty much the way I wanted to. There was, there was very little interference. There was encouragement and uh, uh, appreciation, but uh, if you wanted to write a textbook like this, Nobody ever said, well, now I don't like that approach at all. Let's, let's do it some other way. No one, no one ever, ever did that. So it, it was a lot of fun to develop these things and see how they work with the students. Uh, I guess I enjoyed teaching, uh, particularly the laboratory mm -hmm. courses. History printing, I didn't really enjoy teaching. I once had to teach a salesmanship course, which of course was one of the biggest absurdities. <laughs> Not your cup of tea. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I enjoyed uh, sort of uh, having a chance to, to see printing uh, in a bigger perspective than, than I would had in Vermont uh, where I really didn't know what was going on in printing, but uh, at RIT with the printing trade journals and 
chance to get a, a book on almost any subject you're trying to write. And, uh, it was a lot of fun. I, I think I thoroughly enjoyed uh, those, those, especially those first 10 years, uh, mm -hmm. from 37 to 47. Well, Frank, uh, <clears throat> there was one thing that used to be in effect there at RIT when you and I first came. That was the full professional time and energy contract. Yes, uh, I think probably when I read the con read the contract the first time, it, it, I probably didn't even notice it. But uh, Koch used to mention it, and it was uh, among I don't know how universal it was, but it was it was generally known as. It. FTP and E or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, how many how many hours a week did you keep? I haven't day? any idea. Uh, I I have a feeling that it was probably. Let me see. Uh, oh, in the first place. We started classes I think at nine and quit at four. I think that all the whole schedule was was set up to fit between nine and four. Now, there might have been one or two classes at eight, but as I remember it, it was nine to four, and so a day was six hours, a uh, teaching day was six hours, and I imagine I may have had the equivalent of four days or four and a half days. I, uh, the laboratory courses were, the, the, the time was, of course, different than the lecture courses and the lecture courses and I didn't have many lecture courses to start. I think I had a pretty full schedule. I also used to come in on, uh, on Saturday morning and sort of fuss around and, and uh, get things organized. Did you have any evening? Yes, I did. Uh, I think we had evening courses right from the start. I did right from that second. I, I think they had some the first year, but I don't know. But I'm almost certain the second year they did did because uh, I, I remember one of the students is, uh, is uh, now at Edison, teaches, is in charge of printing at Edison Tech, I don't remember his name. Uh, uh, but I, I remember the, I remember evening school class, yeah, I remember going with uh, Richie, I think, taught evening school even that first year. He was employed by the by the museum, which had a press, and uh, I remember after class, uh, Richie and I would go over to East High School and pick up Peg, who was uh, teaching over there. <coughs> so I don't know, maybe maybe two evenings a week. I was surprised. So it was a pretty full week. Uh from what you mentioned here, at least it would be 24 to 30 hours a week probably of teaching. I would think so, yes. Yeah. That looks a little odd uh, compared to faculty loads these days. And, uh, 12 hours a week is a very heavy load. Yeah. And, uh, and many of the large universities, of course, they have uh, worked that down to six to nine hours a week, which of course is one of the reasons for the financial problems. Yeah. Uh, well, Frank, the total curriculum has certainly changed at RIT. Uh, several different majors now, and of course in the early 50s, we started granting the associate degree, and then in the late 50s, around 56, 57, somewhere, started granting the baccalaureate degree, and then uh, even later, in one or two areas, we can now get a master's degree. Mm -hmm. uh, do you want to comment on this change? Or is this good? These degrees all needed in printing, or what? I think so. Yes, I think the more different levels that that the institute can recognize, the better. Because uh, before, I'm sh I'm sure that <coughs> that it would have been a mistake to uh, to have offered a bachelor's degree in those first few years, because. Uh, well, more than half the faculty didn't have a bachelor's degree, and uh, the rest of them weren't, uh, wouldn't have been qualified to teach in the public schools. So <laughs> it would have been the students weren't shortchanged. 
the, the, that faculty in that first year that I taught there was probably as, as good a as good an assortment of teachers as uh, they've had for <laughs> one while. Yeah. Well, they had the technical and industrial background. Yeah. That's the kids needed. Um, besides myself, Culver, who was certainly an expert in his field and who correlated printing with with art and who gave the students plenty to do and insisted that they do it. And, and I was always amazed at the amount of homework that they had. Uh, Karch, who uh, uh, gave them the, the devil's advocate uh, approach to, to teaching and was and would, would say things that uh, would, would certainly make the students think a little bit about uh, where printing was going. Uh, Richie, when he uh, when he came uh, year following me, uh, was a perfectionist is a perfectionist, and anyone that took printing under him took press work and color certainly uh, certainly didn't get out of it without a, a very thorough knowledge of it. So uh, so. The, in a sense, not only the students got a good background, but the institute got a good background, a good base for going on and and uh, having more courses. In fact, I think probably it was no particular strain at any time to to uh, know what courses to offer because there were, there were probably uh, the the courses were were thought of and planned on a year or two before. Mm -hmm. Well, they were actually offered. And, uh, faculty members would uh, would have some skill that they would want to offer. We're going to record. I remember for several years there, it was extremely difficult, uh, other than employing our own graduates, it was difficult to find faculty members uh, from the outside. Yeah, there was a, a lot of. Uh, of uh, in in, uh, in drawing uh, of, of talent there, but it but it worked out all right, I think. Uh, in this 47 list here, Tufts and Lawson, and I think there were yeah, there was another. There was a fellow in Hofstad called the name of Buck, who yes. took some courses and uh, was also a teacher. So. Uh, People were hired on the on the basis of their ability mm -hmm. to teach generally, and uh, that is generally they were able to teach as well as as on the subject matter. Uh, I think I, I think it uh, it really it really uh, probably probably that's one of the reasons why why RIT was healthier has always been healthier than current what were some of the uh, disappointments that you had while you were at the institute? Well, I don't remember. I don't remember too much in that first ten years because uh, uh, that, up until the time that I decided to leave and go to uh, the commercial controls, uh, I, I was just really getting a good preparation for working in commercial controls. Mm -hmm. Development of the uh, I was uh, when I came back I to the institute in '55. I was working for Graphic Arts Research, and Graphic Arts Research was fairly new, but they were concentrating on color, uh, printing the printing of color. And they were quite scientific about this, quite uh, scholarly in their approach. But I, I could see, and I think uh, I could convince people that uh, that typesetting was one of the most backward of uh, technologies in printing, and that something was going to happen to it. And uh, the graphic arts research might well <coughs> have some part in it. But uh, I guess it was a matter of money. Uh, I guess if the money had been there, or I had somehow uh, 
uh, promoted the money, uh, we might have done some things in, in uh, graphic arts research. I don't think that we should have developed a typesetting machine, but I think that we could well have done some, some investigation of, of uh, oh, the, the, the qualitative uh, comparison between offset printing and letterpress printing, between uh, photo typesetting and hot metal typesetting, uh, what, were the, what were the advantages of photo typesetting and what were the disadvantages, and would those disadvantages be a um, things like that. Typesetting is still, I, I, it hasn't settled down. You see, typesetting went through this period from 1880 to 19, well, in 1880 to say 1915 or 20. It went through the same kind of period that we're going through now. Uh, starting in 1880, they started to invent typesetting machines. They didn't have any typesetting machines before that. They invented probably hundreds of them. Hundreds, uh, probably 25 or 50 of them were actually made and sold commercially. But eventually they all boiled down to just two machines, the linotype and the monotype. Mm -hmm. And all typesetting, when I went to the institute, every single bit of typesetting was done on those two machines. There weren't any uh, typewriter composing machines that were any good uh, at that time. And phototype setting was talked about, but uh, there wasn't much chance of doing it. Now, I think now uh, we've got, I don't know whether we've got hundreds, but we've got certainly 50 different kinds of phototype setting machines. We've got uh, 25 or 30 companies making typesetting systems and machines, electronic uh, devices, uh, but nobody, I don't think, I don't think that that the industry, typesetting industry has, has got to the point where it's going to settle down and come up with two machines that are pretty much standardized and which will do the job. Now, the, the machines they've got now, they do the job, but I don't think we need the, I don't think we need 25 different machines. I think that that the industry is paying for for this a uh, lot of machines by uh, by paying more for the machines, and, and every time a new machine comes out and is bought, uh, then there's a learning period. And it, under the old system. From, uh, from about 1900 to 1950, you buy a linotype machine and you had uh, 10,000 people that could run it. And a guy, a guy that run the first linotype machine in 1885, he could have gone to sleep for 50 years <laughs> and got up out of his bed and sat down at a modern linotype machine in, in 1950 and run it. Well, in a way, this was bad, but in but the point was that there wasn't anything any better up until we got to the They're obviously better, but they're not as good as they could be, I think. So one of my disappointments maybe was that, that I didn't promote or wasn't successful in, in promoting and I never was too good at selling. But uh, it, was, it was something of a disappointment. So I left again and went to, to uh, free. <coughs> and uh, maybe, you know, maybe it would have been if, if I had stayed at, uh, I, I didn't have, I never had quite broad enough of a, an outlook on things. Uh, because, I mean, you, you could look back on it and, and think, well, if uh, you sold the idea more and just ran it and raved and uh, camped on Mark's doorstep and things like that. Why, you might have, you, you might have all of this, uh, I might have had a whole career at RIT. But I really, I don't think I've regretted uh, 
moving going back, back and forth, forth because uh, a lot of a lot of interesting things. Yeah. Well, Frank, I think I'm about out of questions here. Uh, unless there are a few other well, let's things see. you'd like to toss out. Or I think that, uh, Well, I guess I do have this one question that many of you are talking about. you feel that the in Institute uh, School of Printing has had much of an impact on the printing industry as a whole? Gee, I would think so offhand. Uh, they've had some series of seminars which have been very successful. I would think that the ones on the on web press, uh, offset web press operation uh, have been quite successful. Uh, and uh, they've had some on typesetting which uh, I thought were fairly good. Ralph Squire had a, had a bunch. And uh, you know what what Gannett did there with the, with the press uh, Maybe could have been done by RIT. I don't know. Uh, it's pretty expensive, but somehow the net must figure that it, it works out. Um, well, certainly with the hundreds of uh, graduates who have gone out into the industry, yeah. uh, that I guess is the is the uh, <coughs> main thing by which you, you judge. And, and the graduates have, uh, have done quite well. In previous years, of course, the printing people sort of came up through the school of hard knocks. <coughs> Pardon me. Now, yeah, the, and that was one of the reasons, you see, why, why the printing and different typesetting was backward, was because it was a father and son arrangement. And uh, a peculiar thing happened, uh, particularly in newspapers where the mechanical superintendent, the guy that, that had, had charge of actually getting the paper out, uh, he learned his trade and then he probably passed it on to his son or to, to someone that he knew very well. And all and, and all that all that guy had to do was to know how it had been done and do it the same way make a few small changes but by nature the people that had these jobs were not visionary they were not uh, let's do things new way sort of people so the, the, they they weren't they weren't by uh, by uh, innate uh, feelings qualified to make a judgment as to what new equipment should be used and so it was a more difficult this, this change from, from doing things the old way to doing things in some new and better way was hampered by the fact that the people that had to make the decisions were not the kind of people that liked to make those decisions they they, they would much have, most of them there for a long while they would much prefer to have just done things in so, way. So much. Well, Frank, I certainly appreciate your being willing to be interviewed today and to heard some of the recollections that you've had about the Department of Printing, now the School of Printing. This is really valuable, and uh, this will become part of the archive. Well, thank you very much, Leo. I, I've certainly enjoyed it. Probably think of some things that I would like to have said. <coughs> we'll delete any expletives. <laughs> <laughs> 